Hi everyone, I'm Pastor Garrett. I'd like to welcome you to this online resource from Christ Lutheran Church. Uh, if you're new to Christ Lutheran Church, just encourage you to learn more about us by going to our website, which is clcscv.org. Or maybe the better way to get to know us a little bit more personally uh, would be to come to worship on a Sunday morning. Uh, we'd love to have you join with us at either 8.30 a.m. or at 10 o'clock a.m. on a Sunday morning. Uh, so with that, we hope that this Sunday sermon is a blessing and benefit to you and to whoever might be watching with you. God bless. Our gospel reading for this morning is from Mark chapter 5, verses 21 through 43. And when Jesus had crossed again in the boat to the other side, a great crowd gathered about him and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he fell at his feet and implored him earnestly, saying, My little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. And immediately the flow of blood dried up and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, you, are, you see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, who touched me? And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in, fear and trembling, and fell down before him and told him the whole truth. And he said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. While he was still speaking, there came from the ruler's house someone who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? But overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. And he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue, and Jesus saw a commotion, people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, but he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <coughs> I bring grace, peace, mercy to you from God, our Father, Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I don't know if you can hear it and tell in my voice, but there's something going on there. Uh, about 10 o'clock last night, I was starting to get nervous, thinking that I might be losing my voice and uh, not knowing what to do with that. So uh, bear with me uh, this morning. I got through uh, the services, and we'll get through this one together, too, as... Uh, uh, God is a God of healing. Um, when I was sort of preparing for this and looking for my introduction, um, I couldn't help but just get to this point where all I wanted to, to kind of lead into this and even leave it, the sermon itself at, did you hear that? Did you hear that story? So sometimes we, when, when I say we, I mean me as well. Sometimes when we read our Bibles, myself included, it becomes a Bible study, right? 
We read a story, we read an account, we go verse by verse and we, have to, we ask all sorts of questions about context and language and different things. What really happened, all of those sorts of things. But when it comes to this text this morning, it's one, of, like, it's one of those texts to a certain degree where it's just leave it be. Let it be what it is. Just experience, sit in it and experience everything that's happening. The healing, the crowds, the pleading, the begging, the talitha kumi, the grabbing by the hand. Just let it be and let it soak in and shape and form you. Because that is the power of Scripture that God offers to us that, that in this story, it's not just a story or just a, an account of what occurred back then, but it's something that gives you meaning and significance right now about who and what Jesus is doing in your life, about Jesus and what he is doing in your life. And so a certain degree, I just commend you, or I just ask you, just read this story again and again and allow it to be what it is and allow that to shape you and to form you. But because it's a sermon, I have more to say on the, as well. <laughs> um, because the power, like the, the, what exudes out of this story, out of this miracle, set of miracles that we have here, is we get to see Jesus Sort of, it's a prefiguring of how it all is going to end. We're continuing this sermon series on Mark, and we're in Mark 5, as you just heard. It's sort of like beginning, just beginning the second quarter of the game, you know? There's a lot of time left. But right here in this story, we can already see who's going to win the game and how he's going to do it. It sort of is one of those text, those stories that sort of brings everything together before we even get to the end. And what do we see? In this text, I boiled it down to three things. I know, real creative preaching by me this week. Three points. What we see is in this text, in this story, in this account, in these encounters, we see the compassion the patience and the power of Jesus. The compassion, the patience, and the power of Jesus. We see his compassion, certainly. You may, have, you may have come to that right away just by hearing the text itself. You see it in the woman who, when she, she says, I just, if I could only touch his garments, and Jesus has this pity for her and this compassion toward her, and he heals her, Right? Without even anything, him even doing anything. But not just do we see the compassion in Jesus and uh, uh, the woman who is bleeding, but we see it also in Jairus as well. You know, when you um, just think of someone you know, kind of. Not even a friend, just some, even acquaintance. Somebody you know. See, I think Jesus knows Jairus. Um, Jesus has come back from the other side of the lake, the Gentile side of the lake, we get in the beginning of this section. And he's going back to the hometown area. And he's most likely in the Capernaum area. And, and we know that Jesus had taught in Capernaum, he taught in the synagogue there, and here we have this leader of the synagogue, and we have his name as well. It all leads to me to think that Jairus was known, and I think Jesus knew this guy. And, it, and in Capernaum, in the beginning of Mark, we see Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law of a fever. And so why is Jairus coming to Jesus? Because in his own community, he's seen this power of Christ. He's seen the compassion of Christ as well. And But here, Jairus comes to Jesus, falls at Christ's feet, and begs him, begs him, in this last ditch effort, this dire straits moment, the language is like, uh, it says, right, my daughter, my little girl is about to die. It's, 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 it's the sense of it though is that she's almost to her last breath in the original text. It's like she's about to die any moment she's going to pass. 
And so there's an expediency to this. There's a time limit to this begging, this beg, this beggar's request, right? And this is then where we see the patience of Christ. Because even with the, it being such dire straits moment uh, for Jairus, uh, Jairus, depending on how you say it, um, even being this, this dire straits, this last ditch effort, this hopeless cause moment for, for uh, Jairus, we see Jesus take the time to, to not just heal this other woman, but to actually confront her. And in that confrontation, we see something beautiful and profound. This woman who's been hemorrhaging for 12 years, this isn't just a painful circumstance for her. It certainly would be that, physically draining. But when we go back to the Old Testament, we go back to the Levitical law, then we go back to the Torah and we see the purity, impurity codes. And there was a whole point where I was gonna go all into that and what that means. But what we see is that in chapter 15 of Leviticus, and you can go read this, we see that a woman in, in her condition is considered unclean. And not just would she be unclean for like some period, she's unclean for these whole 12 years, which means that she is socially isolated and that she's spiritually isolated as well. Socially isolated in the sense that um, the, the mindset was that even if you touched a person like her, you yourself would become unclean. Her touching Jesus is at risk of actually making Jesus unclean. The fact that she's in this crowd in the first place is taboo and out of norm and not cool because just touching someone, she would make them unclean. And by virtue of being unclean then, she's, now, she's no longer welcomed or able to uh, go to temple or to synagogue to be a part of the religious community, to worship. She's on the outside. She's this outcast, essentially. And so not just does the healing occur, that actually the touch and the drying up of the blood, as the text says, but it's actually, it, Jesus goes a step further, right? He takes the moment to stop in his patience, stop and figure out who it was that touched him. And by doing so, he sets her straight, like sets her right and straight in the community. He reestablishes her because he says, daughter. He calls her a daughter, no longer an outcast, but now a daughter. She's been made clean. And in that, we see certainly the marrying now of the compassion and the patience of Christ. But it all culminates and it all comes together when we see Christ's power in its fullness. And there's the, the very obvious side of the power, right? She touches him, immediately she was healed. That's the sense of power that I think we, as like modern, you know, Western people, that's the sort of power that we sort of uh, gravitate toward. It's the power we sort of desire an immediate, instant gratification, if you will, this immediate effect. But what I find more interesting, in a sense, is actually the power in, in, in not just rising a little girl from the dead, but how he does it. Because it's so, sent, it's, so, it's so soft, and it's so gentle, and it's beautiful. Jesus gets, finally, he, right, he heals this woman, he confronts her, he reestablishes her within the community, calls her daughter, and he finally gets to the home, and she's, the little girl is dead. Jairus was, he was expecting healing. He wasn't expecting a resurrection. He didn't think that was a part of the, the menu, if you will, with Jesus. He didn't, no one did at this time. There had been no resurrection. There was no resurrection of Jesus. Lazarus hasn't happened yet. So the idea of, of, of her dying and that not being the end of it is not even in the ether. He, Jairus is expecting healing. And so when he hears she's dead, to him it's over. But Jesus, right, what we're told, he, he goes in the room, he kicks out the scoffers, he brings with him just a few of his disciples, the mother and the father of this little girl. And he grabs her by the hand. He takes her by the hand and he says, Talitha kumi. 
Now in the English that renders little girl, I say to you, get up. Talithia being little girl. But there's so much more behind that, that term than just little girl. It's more uh, familial, it's more fam familiar, it's more intimate, if you will. It's more like a pet name, Talithia. It's, it's, it's like saying honey or sweetie, like what, a, like what a mother or a father would say to their little girl or their little son, honey, sweetie. I say to you, get up. This is uh, this, the grabbing by the hand and the honey, sweetie, this is what a, a, a mother or a father would do in the wee hours of the morning to wake their child up from bed. And notice he says, she's not dead, she's only sleeping. And it's that power, that soft, you could even say weakness of power that Jesus exudes and shows us in this text, how it's gentle and even patient and delayed in a way. There's the immediacy. We see that in the woman who is hemorrhaging. We see how, how efficacious and how quick the power of Christ can be, but we also see how delayed and yet intentional and how beautiful and subtle his power is. And so there you go, in this text, it's this compassion, this patience, this power that for me, when I was reading this text and when I said it's, it just stands on its own, it's these three things that are coming out over and over again. The, look at the compassion of Christ. Look at his patience and be amazed, as they were amazed, at his power. But the question becomes, in the dark world we live in, with sickness and disease, with death all around us? How do we, how do we really, how do we really see Christ's compassion, patience, and power in our life? And it really boils down to the fact that we're in the same boat as both the woman and Jairus and his daughter. When Jesus restores and reestablishes the woman who is hemorrhaging and calls her daughter, he says, your faith has made you well. Now go live in peace. Your faith has made you well. It is faith that is the lens. If faith is the vehicle, faith is the tool, if you will, that allows us to see the compassion, patience, and power of Christ in our life. And it's cultivating that faith in Christ as God that, that motivates and inspires within us the, the ability to acknowledge and see where God is working in our life. And yet I'm not dumb to, or, or, or not ignorant of the fact that there are times where faith runs dry. When it's hard to have faith and it's hard to believe. And that's where we get the flip of it as well. So this woman who's hemorrhaging, she has this profound faith. If I just touch, right? If I just touch. But here, Jairus, we see him kind of in this, in his dire straits moments, in his last chance, last ditch effort moment. And he, when he hears the worst news that any father could hear, your daughter is dead. What we see is Jesus giving him faith. You know, your faith is not a work. And I think far too often we, we make it that. I have to have more faith. And sometimes you might get that from me or like a preacher of some sort. Like I, oh, I'm not, the reason I can't see God in my life or this is because I don't have enough faith. So I need to work up and muster up enough faith. You know, your faith is not a work. Your faith is a gift. It's been given to you. It's been given to you in your baptism. It's given to you in communion. It's given to you in sermons and in the simple reading and hearing the text, hearing the scriptures. And here we see Jesus give faith to Jairus. Do not fear. Just keep believing or just keep trusting is what Jesus says to Jairus. And to those of you who are in, who might find themselves in dire straits, in a last ditch effort, it's what Jesus is saying to you as well. Don't fear, just keep trusting. It's by faith that we come to experience, we come to know, we come to see the compassion, patience, and 
power of Christ in our own lives. And it's that that I, that, that, that I, that I ultimately pray for you this week that you get to see. Because what this faith inspires of, and what these three things inspire too and what faith leads to is hope. If you are like these two people in dire straits, suffering moments, there is hope. There's hope in Christ. And that hope is found in having, in the having and being given faith. It's the Hebrews um, 11, one definition of faith, right? Uh, for faith is, is uh, assurance in the things unseen or in, in things hoped for, things unseen. Our faith gives us hope in these moments because what he does what he does is ultimately what he did for those two people, what he did for Jairus and his daughter, and what he did for the woman, he does for us. He sets us right, like he set the woman right. He reestablished her inner community. He made her clean. And so Christ has made you clean. He has set you right in relationship between himself, the Father, and God, and yourself. He sets us right. And not just that, but he gives us new life. He gives us new life like he gave Jairus' daughter new life. Because the thing is, is that at, after this, at the end of this, the next thing that happens after Jesus um, raises Jairus' daughter from the dead is he goes home, he goes to Nazareth. And it's there where he's rejected. Like, why would you reject a guy like this, right? The compassion, the patience, the power, raising a little girl from the dead, healing a woman of long suffering. Why would you reject him? And the point being is, remember, we're only in the second quarter, just the beginning. Because at the very end of the story, what we see is Jesus is rejected. We see his compassion, his patience, and his power rejected. And we see him on the cross bleed lead out and take in the suffering of this world. So that, like Jairus' daughter, he would come back to life. See, this is all prefiguring everything that's about to happen at the end of the gospel. And ultimately what that means is it's prefiguring what is going to happen in your life as well. And what not just is going to, but has happened in faith in Christ. That you have been set right and that he has given you new life. In the holy name of Jesus, amen. Let's pray. Lord God, Heavenly Father, I ask that um, you be with us this week, that you guide us this week, and you guide us into experiencing the compassion and patience and power of your Son, and, and that you also give us the um, strength and wisdom to also model that compassion, patience, and power as well in our lives, in our family lives, with our, with our children, with our spouses, with our friends and, and neighbors. And Lord, I pray that you just give um, whoever is in these dire straits moments right now, show them the hope that your son has offered us and how he set us right and offered us a new life. Give them peace and give them comfort. Take them by the hand and, uh, and call them to rise up. And in the holy name of Jesus, amen.